Okay, I pre appreciate you guys showing up tonight, uh, and I appreciate Miguel uh, giving us a presentation on wide field images. So go ahead and take it away. All right. Well, hey, uh, thanks everyone uh, who was here. Uh, wow. Well, um, yeah, thanks everyone who's here, and I appreciate it. Uh, I'm not the, the best at public speaking, but I will do my best to uh, just kind of share my experience with. Um, it's my first year into uh, astrophotography. Um, so I'm just going to share some of my images. I'm just having a loop running in the background. Share screen. How do you share the screen? Here it is. So, <clears throat> you know, like I said, I, I just started this journey last last fall um i went to the botanical gardens uh, with a friend we were chasing a, a, a rare bird for the area a limpkin and he was just telling me man you need to get into astrophotography he'd been even bugging me to do it for some years now and i just uh not that i wasn't interested i i just didn't have the, the time I was so into, you know, the nature photography side of things. <clears throat> so I invested in a, in a small uh, wide field scope, <clears throat> the Red Cat 51, which is on the previous post. I guess I can go back and show you that. So the one to the right was that scope that I invested in the Red Cat. Can I pause it? Yeah, I can. Uh, the Red Cat 51, uh, 250 millimeter uh, focal length. And I had a Skywatcher go to tracker. And my first image was the Andromeda uh, Galaxy M31. I had so many issues. <laughs> Uh, when I first got it, I couldn't figure out how to make the guiding work, the go-to work. Um, it was challenging. The first, the first month that I had that scope and the the, the mount. Uh, so I, I, I think I purchased mm -hmm. it like middle of October. I didn't get my first image until like, you no, know, right before Thanksgiving, like this. I think like right around this time, the 22nd, the 22nd of uh, November. And then from there, I just kept going out every new moon, just trying to get more familiar with it. Uh, so why wide field for me? Um, coming from a photography background, I, I do long lenses, you know, 600 millimeters, 800 millimeters, trying to reach something that's really far away. But there's just a beauty about shooting wide field, especially in astrophotography. It kind of relates to landscape photography. For those of you who like landscape photography, you can see so much of the, the view, you know, the subject. And and for me, it's it's it kind of puts me in awe, like, okay, uh, versus a close-up image. Like you can punch right into the Heart nebula and get them a large 15. But if you just back out with the wide field, you'll get the heart nebula, you'll get the soul nebula, and then the hydrogen regions around both nebulas. And it's just, it's amazing. <clears throat> Not saying that uh, getting close up isn't fun because I do have uh, an edge HD and I, I do use that, getting more familiar with that as well. But I just really enjoy. Um, going wide, wide field. So I'll continue the slide. So these are, I guess, the first 27 images that I've, I've taken with my scope. <clears throat> uh, so after I started with the red cat, uh, I gave myself three, three to four months to get really familiar with it and just trying my hands at different exposures, different targets. Well, different objects <clears throat> and then uh this this spring i really started giving thought 
you know, after reading so many different things about multiple uh, points of data collection, given that Missouri uh, clear night situation is always ideal. So starting this spring, I really started doing my research and <clears throat> started uh, building out um, a, a triple triple rig setup, and you'll see a picture soon. It's all wide field. Uh, they all have the same image scale, same field of view. And, oh, the uh, setup at Brunswick. Yeah, yeah. Looks nice. Yeah, thank you. Should be a picture coming up here soon. So this image right here, North American Nebula, I did that. Same thing as this one here with those three scopes, two scopes, two scopes, I'm sorry. Um, and I collected over 30 hours of data. Now, this one is one of my favorites. Uh, this was with a, a Samyang lens, which is a photography lens that I mounted to an ASI 2600. And the cool thing about the camera lens, it allows me to shoot really wide open. Uh -huh. So I imaged this at f2, I think that was the f2.8. And the data was coming so fast, I had to back down my exposure. So I backed it down to like 30 seconds, 60 seconds, 10 seconds even. This is two hours of data right here. What's the focal length on that? Miguel? 135 millimeters on an APS-C size sensor. So when this image, you can see, of course, cent front and center is uh, B33, Horsehead Nebula, Flame, Flame Nebula. Uh, the lower left is M78. I cannot think of the name of M78 right now, but... M78. So it's like Casper the Ghost Nebula. Casper the Ghost, thank you. And then top right <clears throat> is Orion. But if you look around it, it's so many different other, you know, the gases that are just prominent. Yeah. <clears throat> and if I keep going forward, um I how do I okay? I, I, I did the same region just going closer with a uh Or an AP, not an APSC. It's almost like a micro four thirds, a one inch sensor, and I was only able to get the. Um, let me see if I can find it. There it is. I might start playing after this one. So, this is with a um, ASI five thirty three in the red cat. It just. Took you. It took me from a wide field to just straight into the to, to the object. And uh, this year, I plan to to revisit a lot of these images uh, regions using the Edge HD. <clears throat> so with the Edge HD, that'll take me right into the the horse head itself, B thirty three. And then I have another one. <clears throat> Which I can fast forward. Let me see if I can move this. There we go. Uh, <clears throat> moving so fast. Uh, here is nine. I loaded it up. There it is. <clears throat> and that's the M42 and the Running Man Nebula. This is probably the third image I took with. Uh, that configuration of the Red Cat and the uh, Sky Watcher uh, go to tracker. And photographing in, in winter is not, it's not easy. I'll, I'll be honest. It's cold. Uh, you have to really, you have to really dress up in layers. So as you can see, I'm standing there, and if you look in my little pouch in the tripod, that's a stash of hand warmers. Because Have the first gone thing, with the electric vest? Yeah, you know, I, I don't have one of those, 
but man, that's not a bad idea for this coming winter. Yeah. I, yeah, I love yeah. my electric hand warmers that shove in my pocket. So I use the chemical hand, I guess it's chemical, chemical hand warmers. And I also have toe warmers. So I take off my shoes and stick them in the in the sock and then put another pair of socks over them just to retain uh any kind of heat. And then uh of course head and cover your head and cover your face. Um even though I'm using electronically assisted uh imaging equipment, sometimes I still want to go out and check just to make sure everything's going on okay. Uh that was then, but this year I've kind of refined my process to where I can just stay in my car and just use a tablet and just watch it from the from the tablet. So this was this was my first setup. I still have it, still love it. That was the uh, the white mount is the uh, Skywatcher Star Adventure GTI is a go to mount, and of course the Red Cat with the Pegasus power box to control everything. On the other side is the ASI Air, and the top is a guide scope and a guide camera. Fully go to uh, my friend. I normally go imaging with Bill. He calls it cheating because he uses a uh, a, a camera, a DSLR, no mirrorless camera. Uh, he has a mount that's kind of go to, um, but he has he has a tough time sometimes just getting a composition just right, and um, he does wide feel as well. He likes it, but I think. Deep down, he might be a little envious of how easy I have it. But he was the one who kind of brought me into this, started me on, on this journey. And he tells me every day, he's like, man, you've, you've passed me by so far. Uh, you're like way ahead now. I said, no, man, we're still on the same level. You're just doing it a different way than I'm doing it. Um, so the last, last outing him and I had, I think we did this right here. This is the um, Heart and Soul Nebula. And I didn't spend too much time on it that night. I think I just did maybe, ooh, maybe three hours. But I was able, using right, and using filters as well, I was able to collect decent data that night. So let me show my, sorry for moving so fast, guys. My apologies. And I know I loaded it up, at least I thought I did. Nope, I didn't put it in the queue. I have, um, if ever you come out to, to Brahma Slick and you see a pad with three scopes, there's a strong, strong chance. That's me. <laughs> you know, come say that, hi. Huh? That, that picture wasn't Brahma Slick. With your Which scope set, the one with your uh, GTI. No, photo. that was a Danville. Okay, I have never been there. So Danville, um, there are two spots at Danville. Uh, one is like right on the turnoff as you're coming down the gravel pitch road. There's a little turnoff on the right. And it's basically just an open field with a, a walking trail. I kind of like that area a little bit more than the lower region. The lower region is more easy to get to your gear to mount and load up. Um, you can just take it out from your car and just set it on the gravel. Only thing I don't like about that lower level is the tree. Sometimes, you, depending on your tar your object, there are some uh -huh. trees. There's a tree right there in that field will get in your way. And the light dome from the Love's truck stop. If you go to the first parking lot at Danville, you don't have that problem, in my opinion. It's not as pronounced as the, the mm -hmm. lower uh, parking lot. It sounds a lot like uh, our my prop. I've got some farmland up north by Mark Twain Lake, south of center. Yeah, and uh, it's the skies are just unreal up there. But I've got a, a like a valley area with a pond and a house and. Uh, you know, power and everything that I need. 
uh, but it's kind of in a valley, so I've got trees all around. I got a couple big trees that are really in the way. And then I've got a hill up. It's got a pasture, and it's just like wide open. It's on top of a hill, and it's beautiful up there, but there's no resources. <laughs> so I'm hoping to I'm hoping to put a uh, observe get some power and uh network cable ran up there to get uh to put a roll off roof i can have some people out once i get some things set up up there mm -hmm. it's uh by uh new london off of highway 19. i've, I've heard of that <clears throat> uh, so that's going up 61. yeah yeah. New London New London is Yeah. Is that I, past that's past Edna, right? New London is uh, past Edna. Edina, I'm sorry, Edina. Are you thinking uh uh I can't think of it. There is a there is a town that starts with an E. <laughs> yeah. Because you, you uh, turn, yeah. yeah, you turn you sharp left, you go to that town. I think New London is the fork that goes up. Yeah, so you go up past Bowling Green, then through yep, Frankfurt. That's it. That's it. Yep. Yeah, and when oh, you that's... hit New when you hit New London, it hits nineteen and takes you back down to center. It's a wow. class class three, and I'm telling you, and I've had some nights up there; it's unbelievable. Wow. Hmm. Yeah, that that'll be. Uh... Sounds like a really nice place to image. So you're you're building on that property now, you're saying? I've got a house on it. Uh my me, my brother, and my mom. It's part of my grandpa's farm. So it's been in the family for a long time. Yeah. So the house but the house is down in the valley where I have resources and I and I can do some good imaging down there. But up on a hill is like uh much better you know the, um, the, how far would you say is uh your house from the top of the hill where you will be imaging oh it's quite a way a uh, thousand feet okay up up a hill yeah so i've been working on some plans <clears throat> to make it better up there yeah i'm watching this guy uh in canada and he has a similar situation to yours where his house is down, not so much of a valley, but on the side of a hill. But at the top of the hill, he built an, a roll-off shed type observatory. Mm -hmm, that's what he I want to He ran a uh, network cable all the way from his house. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it was an interesting process watching how he did that. And it's like, wow. So he says now he can image from his home all year round. And he's in mm -hmm. where he is in Canada is pretty remote. So he's in a border, I think like a border class one sky. I'm like, wow. That's insane. So I'm, yeah, I'm it sounds to... like it sounds like he did exactly what I'm thinking of doing. Yeah. I was gonna, yeah, I was gonna bury uh two network cables and two power cables from the house to a spot on the hill. Mm -hmm. Put my shed up there. Yeah. I'll send you the, um, just shoot me an email and I'll send you his video. I think, I'm not sure he has a website, but it's all on YouTube, so. Okay. Yeah. And what's your email? Uh, I'll put it in the chat. Okay. How do I... Okay, I just sent it to the chat. All right, so this this screen here, this image, this is my uh, pre-setup, uh, wide field setup. And then the red cat is on the left. So the red cat, I have that paired with an APS-C sensor. The white one in the middle is a 400 uh, millimeter focal length 
appeared with a full frame camera. The one on the right is the 135 millimeter paired with a micro four thirds sensor. So when I image <clears throat> any target, all three of these have the same image scale, same field of view. And I'm getting more familiar with picking site now that I know how to do image integration and it will combine all of the data into one, you know, one finished master sub. And I just started doing that. And the data is, it's, it's unreal. So you're going from a full frame, that's 61 megapixels. The one in the center, the one on the left is 24 megapixels. The one on the right is 20 megapixels. And it's it, it takes a lot of processing power to do it, but the images look unreal. Uh, so much depth, so much detail. So this is not for everyone. I'll, I'll be honest, because it, it takes sometimes a little time oh. to set up. But the reward is just it's. It's next level. I guess that's the best thing I can think of. It's the next level. And I'm actually working on another project. Um, and here is, I don't know if you can see this one. This is mm -hmm. the edge, uh, the 400 and the 135. And this is a Danville. This is at the uh, turnoff on the right on Danville, coming off the gravel road. Uh, so there's a, another project that I'm working on. Oh, let me find it first, hold on. So I'm building a, 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 a tandem rig. It has two e electronic focusers, uh, 135 millimeter uh, fo focal length. And I haven't decided on which cameras that I'm going to go with. Might be two 533s, which are one inch sensors, or two 183s. If I go with the two 183s, what that will give me is. <clears throat> four times the imaging get light gathering capabilities. It'll go from these two and then, and then it'll give me four. So in, in a given night, what is that? 32 hours? Mm. 32 hours in one in one night. So I go from if I had one scope, it's only eight hours, I go to four, I'll have 32 hours. And there's some targets that you, you need that much time. Um, the squid net, the squid nebula, and uh, was it SH two one twenty nine? That's the, like it's called the flying bat, and in the center of the flying bat is the squid nebula. I haven't imaged that one yet, but um, that, that'll be a, a target for next year. You need to use uh, either an O three filter. Or one of those uh, narrow uh, three three nanometer dual dual band. Yeah, I have to get um, the squid. I have the um, L ultimate um, HAO three three nanometers. Yeah, we just did that one, and it doesn't show up in just uh, RGB. It's so here's here's my plan for that, um, and that was Mark, right? Yeah. So. In addition to, to this, I have a slew of filters as well. I have two HA03 filters. One's a five nanometer, one's a three nanometer. Then I have you know RGBs and um, broadband filters. So what I plan to do is one filter, one, one, one scope, I will only collect um, RGB stars. So I'll use an RGB, well, 
I guess I technically don't need to use an RGB filter, but I, I might. I'm still learning. Uh, it's hard to get good star colors with any of those filters. So no filter. Okay. So one scope will be no filter. One scope I will have um, just for luminance. <clears throat> and the other two will be for the hydrogen and the oxygen. So one will be for the RGB stars, one will be for luminance. And the other two. <clears throat> Will be for um and and he said Mark, Mark, were you the one who spoke at the last meeting about short exposures? Yes. Yeah, that was me. Thank you. I tried your technique at two hundred and forty seconds versus you know three hundred or longer, and I came away with this. At 240 seconds. And this is just a single exposure, 240 seconds, with an IDAS. It's called an, an NBZ, a nebula, nebula boosting filter. And it's it didn't turn out bad. I mean, I it's unprocessed. And I just loaded it up just to see what it would look like and doesn't look bad. Well, I mean, the point of taking shorter exposures is, uh, it's not the any one image, one frame doesn't have you don't have to see anything in it. It's the benefit of being able to stack two times or three times as many exposures, right? That'll bring out the detail. So correct, um, correct. It's not going to attack your computer. As well, <laughs> what's that? I said, oh, oh, yeah. I just uh, ran a weighted batch reprocessing uh, session on uh, some RGB and dual band images of the same thing, and it took an hour on a very fast i nine uh, processor. So yeah, it takes a lot of it takes a lot of processing time to do all of the. Uh, calibration and uh, registration and integration with that many frames but so do you do you um, do you have a dark library yep okay. so I have, I have a question for you um I was speaking to two friends recently and they said that they don't shoot darks or flats. Now I pause because I'm like, well, how are you getting rid of your dust motes if you have any? And how are you calibrating out your noise? And their response was Grap Expert or PixInsight DBE. And just taking a lot of exposures. They're trying to remove the, well, yeah, but you're not going to remove hot pixels doing that. Exactly. The hot pixels are going to be in the same spot on every image, and uh, none of those statistical processes of, I mean, DBE and Graxpert and all that stuff is all uses statistical process to say, is this pixel in this image that much different than all the rest of them, and should I throw it out? But if it's the same pixel in every image, the only thing it can do is leave it there. Exactly. So, and it doesn't take that much. I mean, taking darks and flats, you, you do it one time. I mean, we're using, we've had our, our, uh, my scope out in New Mexico for a year now. And we got bias, dark, and darks that we've been using forever. Uh, okay. There's no reason to ever really ever change them unless you change cameras. Right. Uh, you know, if you have, with you, with three or four different cameras, you got to have darks and you got to have darks and biases for each one of those. Right. Uh, the flats you have to take with your setup. You probably got to take flats every time you go image because uh, you're if you're futzing around with the the image train at all. When you break right. it down so, and put it back together, you got to take a flat. The, so that's another thing uh, that Mark that I do. Everything that you see as far as my imaging setup, and I can show you some of the pictures that I have. 
it it never leaves uh it stays all to, all intact okay so you you need one set of flats then i that's the scope the refractor i we've got out i've got out in new mexico right now we've got a set of dark flats and biases that we took last year in december and we've been using them for the entire year the same okay. exact images uh, yeah. because with the refractor the uh, whole image train is sealed from the outside um, which isn't necessarily true for some types of reflectors although your c11 is also sealed so you're not going to get any dust or anything inside of the between the objective and the camera um, so there's no reason that's the only reason you would have to take flats again if you don't if you never break down your image train so yeah, so what I'm in the process of doing right now is like building a library for my flats and 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 darks. So I'll likely I'll shoot at let's say two forty, may go down to one eighty, and I'll just have enough for each uh, setup and you know each each camera I should say. I mean, darks aren't near as important these days as they used to be with uh, okay. the new low read noise sensors like the ones that you're using okay you know, particularly the 2600 and the 6200 uh okay. sensors uh but so, i mean if, if you look at the if you look at the um the statistics for your darks you know the the median adu value keeps going up as you take longer and longer darks which means it's going to go up as you take longer and longer images too so you know, so what what I've been doing is let's say I go out for six hours. Again, I'm still learning, so I shoot darks that equals that. So should I not be doing that that many darks? You do you should just take darks for whatever your exposures are. Okay, is that the it doesn't matter. And uh, the gain for the camera needs to be the same. Right? I'm sorry, you're you're breaking up for me, Dave. Is it the go? We have to also have separate dark for the different gain settings on the camera. We never change the gain setting our camera. We, we always leave it at what they call the Unity, Unity gain, gain. Yep. Uh, yeah. 100 on ours. So, mm -hmm. yeah, if we changed the gain, we would have to change. We would have to take right. different darks and biases probably. Yeah, also. So I keep, I keep my gain at 100, Unity gain. So let's say I go out tonight. Unity gain is 100, exposure to 40. Anything that changes the amount of light frames. So I've always, again, still learning the process. I, I shoot, if I shoot 200 lights tonight, I'll shoot 200 darks. I'll start it and I'll go to work, come back, and it's done. Uh, you don't need to do that. Whatever whatever exposure you use, let's say you're taking 240 second exposure, 240 second frames, uh -huh. you just need 240 second darks. And you can do that once. They're, they don't change. Got it. So you need, you know, 40, 207, 240 second darks that you integrate into a master dark for 240 seconds. Again, at, at whatever gain you're using. And unless something goes wrong with the camera, you really never need to change those. Uh, I guess it, it depends on the temperature. They should all be about the same sensor temperature, too. So you said 40 darks, is that what you said? That's typically what we use. You can take more or less, but okay. 40s usually. So 40, 40 darks, 40 flats. I've never used bias frames. Biases are uh, quick because they're taken basically at zero exposure. It's just the read or the, the um, what do they call it, the sensor noise or the readout noise uh, for okay. the sensor. What about, mm -hmm. uh, what's the other one, dark flats? Uh, I don't take dark flats because um, the, 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 the sensors that we're using, the, the low noise CMOS sensors, um, when you take flats, you take very, very short exposure flats, like two tenths of a second, or maybe two seconds for a narrow band. And uh, the biases, 
I use biases as dark flats for all of those because the noise levels in a bias is almost the same as a noise level for up to about a five or six second long exposure. So, so a bias is an image you take with the shortest possible exposure time you can, you can come up with. You know, right. if, if you can set it to zero, it'll it'll take an exposure for some amount of time, but it'll be like a millisecond or something yeah. like that. Uh, okay. Flats you take at whatever exposure will give you a, a median ADU value of about half of whatever the maximum is, which is, you know, about 30,000 for a 16-bit camera. And then the darks are taken with absolutely no light. I usually put a cover on it, and I also put a piece of aluminum foil over it to try to cut down on any kind of IR or UV that might get in there. And those you just take to be the same exposure as your uh, your your light frames is the image frames that you take. And when you calibrate the flat, you calibrate them with by I calibrate them with biases because there's no point in having dark flats for two second exposures. The dark flats are only to calibrate your flats. And okay. you know, in, in some of the older cameras, uh Dan will, Dan didn't know more about this than I do. Uh but some of the older CMOS cameras in particular had something called a, a amp glow. At the, the point where the sensor connected to the electronics, it would get a little hotter there. Yeah. And you could actually see a, like a cone of light coming out from that corner of the image, which would get brighter the longer the exposure was. But the 6200s and the 2600s and the other new ones don't have amp glow. And the noises... Yeah. The noise for short exposures is very so my my 183 has a little bit of amp glow. You need you probably don't need dark flats for that one unless the flats unless you have need to take like 20 second flats or something for a O3 or HA filter. Yeah. Flats you gotta have separate for each filter. Correct. Correct. It took me a long time to figure out all, all that stuff. I've been doing this for about two years, so I got maybe a year more experience than you, and it took a while to get all of the calibration frames that you need and what they're used for and, and how the, the processing handles them and stuff like that, get that straightened out. All right, and there's so much information online that it's like going down um, the rabbit hole, right? Alice in Wonderland style, and one person says, "No, you need to do this." I, I mean, if you got somebody that's talking about a camera that's ten years old, the answer is completely different than yep. the stuff you've got too. Yep. Uh, and if you got a CCD camera, I don't even know what the answers are for CCD cameras. Uh, Dan's the expert on that, but yeah, you don't have CCD cameras, so I know. No. Hey, hey Miguel, I, I got a question for you about. About histogram. So, so uh, mystified by you know how to set those up for wondering how, how much effort to put into worrying about setting up exposures based on the histogram for the point of sky objects. Um, is that something you do or is not paying attention to the histogram or you talking or, to me, Dave? I'm talking to uh, both um, of you. Or, but Oh, Whoever okay. knows about histogram. I can't. I can't. You're. You're. Does. Is, does everybody else have trouble with Dave's audio? Because I can't hardly understand him. He's a little garbled. Yeah. Sorry. I'm. Uh, I'll try to move things around here. Um. Can you hear that a little better? Much better. Yeah. That's better. All right. Um. Yeah. I just wanted to know how. If, um. If you guys commonly set up your um. Exposure times, you know, using the histogram uh, indicator for a given field of view, or is that kind of a you know, not something that matters so much for these time type objects? Um, I I can speak on that. I I do not look at the histogram, and I know I should coming from digital and film photography. Um, I don't I don't look at that histogram at all. 
So maybe Mike, Mark can help me with this one, get a little bit of understanding. Should I be really uh, looking at Instagram at all while, while imaging? I don't bother with it. I don't even try to stretch single frames out to see if there's anything in there because um, the exposure, the exposure, unless you've got uh, bright skies, which, you know, if you've got right. four or four or five skies or something like that, well, then you probably do need to expose for a little bit longer, but that's just because um, you need to separate the signal, whatever you're seeing from the brightness of the sky. But it, I, and I'll caution everybody, a lot of the stuff that we do, that I do, is based on shooting from New Mexico with Bortle 2 skies generally. Uh, and I mean, that makes a big difference, but um, you know, you can stack enough, you could stack enough 60 second exposures of some dim object as long as it's brighter than the sky yep. and you're not going to see anything on in your, your individual frames. But if you took 200 of them and you stack them, you can stretch even a tiny little signal out of what's there. So, yeah. So, so I guess I'm more worried about the situation of having an image with a, uh, you know, a lot of faint stuff that's really interesting, but then um, one or more very bright stars in the same field. So, you know, if you close longer, you know, the okay. one bright star is going to be way off square. And do I care about that or not? For the image? I mean, if it's the quantitative stuff, quantitative analysis, yeah, you might care, but maybe, you know, in the processing, later there's lots of ways to deal with that i think and i i, I would prefer not to worry about it at all um, as well and, and just you know go for um you know longer exposure if, if the condition you know, allowed it i um, just wonder what it sounds like i got the answer if you guys don't worry about that yeah you know, oh. it, it comes out okay yeah, what I'm doing is, you know, Mark recommended this in the last uh, meeting. Um, just like, as far as exposures, I used to go, you know, for 300 seconds and 600 seconds, but it's not, not really, I won't say it's not needed, um, but there's a, there are easier ways get the same results using um, shorter exposure time. And I, I've adopted it and I, I like how it looks. And then it saves me time too. You know, I can collect more, more frames, more, more lights. And when I stack, it just, kind of, I guess, balances, evens things out, I guess. It just takes a lot of more computer time to. Yeah, it does. To to calibrate them and stack them. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I mean, as far as that's concerned, you could, you could either go buy or go and assemble uh, a high end, very fast machine, be running Linux if you wanted to, that could just chew through all of that pre processing stuff for a tenth of what you've already spent on you know, four telescopes and four cameras and four mounts and four sets of filters and all the rest of that stuff that, you know, I, you know, the equipment you got, you spent a lot of money on. I don't care how much it was, but one computer to do that processing is 2,500 bucks is a lot to spend for a really fast computer to do your processing. So. Yeah. So what I did, I actually built out my, my computer using an Alienware chassis and uh board and i upgraded to 120 gigs of ram it has a really nice processor really nice you know video card it it turns through pretty fast what's your cpu cooler it's uh liquid cool okay yeah. that's that's the right answer because that's all of those chips if they're not cooled well 
throttle back if they get too hot. Yep. yep. I got mine set up so that it, it runs forever with the chip at 100 degrees centigrade. You can yep. boil water on the chip, but it'll run you know, the AIO liquid cooling thing. will keep it at that temperature. Yep. So you got the right processing system. Yep. Um, I, I mean, for, for me, don't set your exposures based on something you see on Astro Bin or, or something like that. Set them to what works for you, you know? And from everything I've read, it, it seems like it's the reverse logic, but in brighter skies, shorter exposures are better. Darker skies, longer exposures. And the reason for that is if you have bright skies, if you're in a Boral four, four sky, you can't see the faint stuff. Right. Doesn't matter. You take a 10,000 a second exposure, you're not going to see the faint stuff. It's going to get blown out by the sky. Okay. So there's no point in taking exposure to try to pick it up because it's not going to show up. In a really dark sky, you're going to see that much fainter uh, nebulosity. And so it makes sense to take a longer exposure to try to get to that stuff that you can't even get to in brighter skies. So, you know, set your exposure based on what your camera can actually see, what the what's going to show up. I mean, if there's anything out there that's brighter than the sky, you can image it. If it's not, you're never going to see it. And none of that stuff shows up in the histogram because it's all right down there by the the background anyhow. And so if you try to adjust your histogram based on what you're seeing in a single image, you're just adjusting the sky brightness, not the signal, because you can't you can't see the signal. Yeah, I understand. You, you can't you can't see the signal for the thing you care about. You're seeing the signal from all the background that you're going to try to subtract out anyway later. Right, right. I mean, if you want to set a high gain and take a longer exposure for for framing, that's fine. But I wouldn't. I don't. I don't do it for the imaging. So, quick question for you, uh, Dave. When you're imaging. Do you use live stacking or before you start imaging, do you do a preview? Like just take oh, a, yeah. okay. So let's say you're planning to image, I don't know, the Orion Nebula. No, that's a bad choice. <laughs> um, the, heart and the, soul, the heart and soul is a good one because you have to frame soul. that properly. You get it 90 Hardest. degrees out and you see the middle of, or the, two edges instead of the whole thing, right? All right, so let's do hard and so. What I do, <clears throat> get the composition that I want, you know, get everything right, and then I will do a 240-second exposure as a preview uh, in the ASI here, see what that looks like. And if it looks good, when it, when it, it you know, it, it'll, it'll spit out a, a preview image, I'm, I'm happy with that. I set that as my auto run um, exposure and it will go with that all night. Another thing you can do in the ASI air is you can do live stacking, I think. I, I haven't tried it yet, but live stacking, you can see everything as it's it's you know, it's it's processing and then stacking the images. So you'll you'll almost know right away like, okay, I can keep this or I can change it. Well, yeah, I mean, Miguel, I, I... I've done a lot of live stacking there on Friday night open house events because it, it works for the public um, to see this image appear, you know, with 30 second exposures. Um, and, and a lot of fairly bright objects work for that. But, but some of the, the wide field stuff, the faint stuff that you're looking at, you know, I, I do exactly what you would do. I you know, just, you know, take a preview, you know, 200 uh, seconds or whatever, and then, um, Try not to, what I've usually done is try not to go ex exceed the maximum for the camera, um, a, a histogram in that preview. 
Um, but maybe, maybe, maybe the histogram is misleading me, you know, and I should just, you know, do what, uh, you know, do something more like what you've done, or um, embrace this short exposure strategy and uh, yeah. go for that. Because I, I, I missed Mark's talk last month. I was out of town. I need to go. If it was recorded, I'll go back and look at it. And I, I did, you know, got pretty excited when I heard about that new software um, fixing site was putting out for processing those kind of pictures. It's, it's definitely something I want to want to try myself. Um, short exposures take away all this worry about tracking you know, <laughs> super accurately. And um, I now it's, you know, got occasional wobbles in it. So I, I, I think it sounds, you know, like a great thing to me to embrace that. I, I do not use the PixInsight Fast integration. That is for a radically short exposures of deep sky objects of like two second or five second frames and taking thousands of them. And I tried running that and you probably need 256 gigabytes of memory for that process to run because it just sucks up memory. You know, you have to, you have to, you have to integrate them in batches of like 40 or 50 frames uh, because that's the most, it, it has to load them all into memory at once, you know? So if you got a big camera and you're trying to integrate 500 five second images, you're going to have to do it in bat, 10, bat, 10 different batches or something like that. So I do not use that. If that's what you're referring to, the fast integration stuff, I don't do that. Oh, well, then, you know, I was referring to that. So I, I really have to listen to your <laughs> your, your talk to figure out uh, another strategy, because I, I thought that's what you were talking about, Mark. No, no, no. Uh, I'm just talking about in that in the last month, there's a link in there to uh, a video by a guy, the guy who wrote Sharp Cap. And I can't remember what his name is anymore. Um, that talks about what's the optimal exposure time to use under various different conditions. And that's what I'm going with. And it's, it's like his point was the, the, the brighter your skies, the shorter your exposure should be and the more exposures you should take. So, you know, you got a, you got a certain amount, number amount of imaging or certain amount of imaging time. Let's say you got five hours of imaging time. Do you break that up into a bunch of 600 second, exposures or a bunch of 120 second exposures and the answer to that is what's your equipment and what's the sky look like mm -hmm. you know you still take five hours of exposures but you might take um four minutes is 15 times five so it's like six is that right 600 no, that's not right whatever it is however it would break up into to Oh, two minutes. So that would be 150 exposures or um, 30 exposures at 600 seconds. You know, you just, you take the same mm -hmm. in bright skies. Well, the summary basically was that your signal to noise ratio goes down as the square root of your exposure time. But it also goes down as the square root of the number of frames that you integrate. Okay. Hmm. So the 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 physical properties of the camera means that um, you know, as as your as your signal gets higher with longer exposures, the ratio between the signal and the noise goes down by the square root of the exposure time. But in the stacking process, which is a statistical process, the signal to noise ratio goes down as the square root of the number of frames that you integrate. So it doesn't matter which exposure you use. You get the same signal to noise ratio benefits as long as it's the same total length of imaging time, whether it's broken up into a bunch of 120 second exposures or a bunch of 600 second exposures, you know, and. Mm -hmm. The, the shorter exposures are better for brighter skies and the longer exposures are better for darker skies, which seems totally counterintuitive, but, or did to me the first time I read it, but it does make sense to me now. 
It, yeah, it does sound backwards, but um, the reason I like the shorter exposure time is, is another reason. It's just um, like putting, um, not putting all your eggs in one basket, which you have more, right. more shots on goal with many more short exposure times. But you have some technical problem in the middle. You know, you find out about it quicker or, you know, you're not putting so much job. Um, on right. tracking and all that stuff. One bad image only costs you a fifth as much at 120 seconds as it does at 600 seconds. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and you know, time under the sky it it is precious. You want to get the most out of those hours. I understand that's that's pretty informative, Mark. I have to look at look at that hard. You can't find a link to that uh, um, video from that guy. Send me an email or something. Or yeah, post, I, I, post an email and and, and uh, I'll find it for you. Thanks. I, I'll 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 screw it away if I can make it that. But I, I'm very sure. Joe Zia and I have been doing that with both the 434 millimeter refractor and with the 2500 millimeter 14 inch uh ref reflector out in new mexico since i think we started like in march and so we don't do i mean he used to do 480 and 600 and maybe 900 second exposures especially with the the 14 inch we don't do that anymore all of them are shorter exposures now but i, I mean there's a in a way, our situation out there is completely different. You know, we, we haven't been out there. We haven't touched any of the scopes, done anything since last December. They're still sitting there hooked up, running exactly the same. Nothing's. We're going to go out there next month and clean things up and change things around a little bit. But um, we're running it remotely. We set up a sequence to run for the entire night. We start it up when it gets dark out there. And go to bed so that's a completely different scenario from you guys who have to cart your crap out to Bromel stick or danville and set it all up and you know takes you 45 minutes just to get ready to go and then you got another hour and a half drive back home after you break it down again uh, you know so our situation is a little different than 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 yours. I, I I think I would still do short exposures if I was doing it from my backyard or someplace locally, but I would make some maybe some slight changes to the to the way we do it. You know, and and we don't care. The skies are clear enough out there. We can some of those pictures I've posted have been, you know, it's taken us two weeks together all of the frames that that we use to put into one of those pictures, but. Like, who cares? It's just the scope is running and we're sleeping. <laughs> hmm. So, I, all that stuff has to come into consideration in how you run your scope and how you do your processing, I think. Yeah. Well, you know, in my case, I, I am kind of interested in at least dipping my toe into this fast imaging idea. I, I built a computer for, you know, for one of these gaming computer type things that, you know, it runs pretty fast. I don't, I'm not, I'm not pushed it with large data sets or anything, but um, heck, if I, if I ever look at a, a big, you know, long processing time that runs all night while I'm sleeping, that's okay. <laughs> so that's another way to, to, to try to get a, a better image with um, different strategy, let the computer well, run all night. Before you dive into that fast imaging thing, do a test with it and see how it works for you. I, it just I tried it once and it was like, no, I'm sorry, this is this is not for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I I have no idea how it'll work, I, and I'm I'll be doing it with a you know 90 millimeter refractor. Um, so so like you know dipping my toe in there and then just just playing with it. Or it sounds like a, it might be interesting, or it might be a total disaster. But I will try. <laughs> the problem we had is is uh, we've got a twenty six hundred, which is reasonably fast download, 
in a, a full frame ASI 6200, and it takes like six seconds to download an image from the 6200. Well, it's like if you take five second exposures, you're going to spend more time downloading than you are imaging. So it's like, I mean, there's a limit to how short you can get your exposures. And I don't know. I, I don't know that that fast imaging is really designed for anything, even as long as a 30 second exposure. Uh, maybe it I is, but so. it, I mean, it's designed for real. It's, it's like the lucky imaging kind of stuff that you do for planetary more than, and it's basically doing lucky Jimmy, lucky imaging for DSOs, you know, at two seconds instead of two milliseconds that you would do for Jupiter, maybe, you know, um, <laughs> but uh, I try it. If, yeah. if, it, if if you come up with some solution where it works, let me know because I mm -hmm. didn't see it. <laughs> yeah, I I will uh I'll report back at some point. <laughs> okay. Nice, nice. Uh talking about pixel site. Uh has anyone tried the new script toolkit oh. for Graxberg? Yes. Yeah. You said yes. It just runs great. It just uh, runs Graxpert without you have to. It just runs Graxpert without you having to run Graxpert, basically. Yeah, yeah essentially, so it, 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 it keeps it all. It keeps it all in Pixinsight, Insight, and I, I like that. I like that. How, Mark, how do you? How would you compare the new Graxpert to Pixinsight's DBE? If I have back, if I have, uh, um, uh background that I need to extract, I use Graxpert, period. Okay. Yeah. But that's the other nice thing about shooting from New Mexico is we you know very, very rarely have any great kind of gradients in there. And usually we have gradients. It's not due to something in the sky. It's due to something we did. And it's there's nothing there's nothing that's good for taking out gradients out of bad images versus out of bad gradients. <laughs> so. So, so does that um, taking out gradients also apply to this latest thing they're talking about in Pix Insight, this multi-scale all-sky reference project? Yeah. So, is that the idea that you collect the images of the whole sky and then use that as a to take out gradients? No, no. I think what you're talking. No, about... I think what he's talking about is right, Miguel. It's it's this new really? project they're talking. They want to. They want like full coverage RGB of the entire sky. Yes. And then if you submit an image that you want a gradient removed from, they'll compare your image to what the reference is for that, and anything that doesn't look like that is a gradient, and they'll take it out. Basically, using AI. It's on, yeah. Is that what you get from it, Dave? Yeah, that's what I was reading about, and um, you know, okay, it's, it's going to take a while to implement, but I just wondered if you guys, you know, were planning to get after that eventually. It's uh, I say I read that in Astrobin, so it's it's gradients. Okay, I thought it was something different. Okay, but I mean, they're, they're the the only image, the only thing I saw was they sent an uh, email out asking for people to contribute images, and I assume Period. that's just so they can build up the the ground truth for yeah. for for what they eventually want to do with AI. So yeah, they're they're going to collect some of their own data. They'll take take uh, images from users, a whole bunch of different strategies there, but. Eventually, it becomes a, a big database. Your images might, your wide field of images might be useful to them for that, Miguel. I would think that they'd want wide field more than they want a bunch of narrow yeah, that, field. Yeah, that, that's why I brought it up because, you know, if you're in the wide field imaging world, this sounds like a good tool. To me. Okay. Because the, the way I read it, I thought they were just limiting it to the southern hemisphere. Because I, I I didn't read it from the Pix Inside email, I read it from Astrobin, and that's where I saw it first. I'll go back and try to find the Pix Inside email, and um, yeah, I'll contribute some data. Astrobin's like the Facebook of uh, 
extra for time. So. <laughs> yeah, there, there's some discussion on the um, Picks and Sight forum announcement about it, and more a lot more details than I remember right now. But, but uh, definitely, it's a wide field uh, problem, you know, uh, an opportunity really. Uh, it's called the. Well, I enjoy talking to you guys, but I got to go. Sorry. Uh, All right, Mark. Okay, Good talk to you, sir. Thanks for your presentation, Miguel. It was very interesting. Thank you. Appreciate it. See you uh, right. Have a good Thanksgiving, everybody. See you right before Christmas, I guess. All right. Yeah. You too, Mark. Take care. Enjoy. Mark? Yeah. I don't have any other. Uh, if anyone has any other questions, um, you know, feel free to. I'll put my email. I think I put it in the in the chat. You can email me. Um, I'll you know, do my best to help them. Also, out of Brahma Snack every Friday night, weather permitting. Um, yeah, I always stop by and, you know, those chop shop, as they say. And I'm glad to learn from you guys as well as you uh, can learn from me. So, yeah, I have a lot to learn. <laughs> it's you're fun, a, though. It's, 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 you're a real it's photographer. Fun. I'm sorry. You're a real photographer. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, if, you, if you guys have time, I can kind of show you. Well, besides nature photography, besides astro, I, uh, I do different types of photography as well. I do birds, um, just nature, landscapes, wildlife, um, you know, macro photography. These are some of my bird trips from when I went back home. Oh yeah, yeah, you got some real tropical species there. Yeah, these are these are all from back home. And I do landscape. This is Forest Park, Art Hill. This one right here. So oh, yeah. like two years ago, I think. And I do. I'm trying to show you some more of my landscapes. It's very good. And here's my landscapes that I do. Beautiful. Long, long exposures. Oh, uh, looks like parts of southern Missouri. Yeah, uh, Alley Springs. I've been there. You have big, big springs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How's that look familiar? There you go. It's Alley Springs for you. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's that's a that's that's a nice spot. If you ever go camping down there, that's a bottle class two sky down there. So it's yeah, nothing. you know, I I've done a lot of canoe trips in that area, and I, you know, before I was doing astronomy, but you know, it, it'd be a challenge. I mean, you could put your a telescope in a dry bag and <laughs> float it down there. That'd be okay. Yep. I I don't know. I'll, I'll be. It'll be a nervous ride for me. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's you know lots of uh, campsites on gravel bars out there that'd be pretty isolated and. That's a good know, idea. That stuck is. In the, you'd be down in the trees a bit, at, you know. But Alley Spring by the campground there is. So wouldn't, wouldn't, the, wouldn't the trees be an issue? Oh, big, no. issue. big issue, yeah. They wouldn't have a lot of view. Well, one thing I I was surprised um, when I bought this refractor telescope is that um, it works pretty well as like a birding body scope. Kind of thing. If, if I had an alt as mount, particularly, um, I you know, take it out to, you know, like the confluence uh, wetlands or something, and um, it would work. It would be great. I, I need to I need to do that sometime. Yeah, that that's that was one of the selling points of the red cat. It can be used as a birding lens. Right. I haven't tried for birding yet, but. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I did it. I've only 
done it a little bit, but I you know put a, a right angle uh, lens uh, holder on on there, and uh, you get an upright image. Birds are upright, not <laughs> upside down, and um, that's all you need. It was a uh, you know it's a five you know nice five hundred millimeter optics, and um, you can do a lot with that. So, nothing else to do with this case. I'll stop sharing. But yeah, like I said, you know, it's 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 been um a nice year uh into this journey of astrophotography. You know, a lot of my friends are like, why did you stop shooting wildlife? Why you stop doing landscapes? And you know, to be quite honest, I wanted to give myself a distraction-free learning process because the imaging part isn't that hard once you figure it out. It's the processing. That is, it's challenging because you want to do it right. Um, you know, I, I see people post some images like, hmm, I wonder what is their process? What is your thinking? You know, <clears throat> if this is what you saw when you imaged it, why is it not looking the same? And I guess it, at the end of it, it's, it's the artist's interpretation of, of the work. But my goal is, you know, I try to keep it, I want to say natural. I try to keep it close to the original because using filters is not part of the natural process. And I, I, I preface that by saying filters can see what we can't see. Right. So the data is there. We just can't see it. And it's my job to interpret that data and bring it to you in a manner that you can see as pleasing. Yeah. And it's something that uh, kind of fits into the visible wavelength range that we're using, you know, normally with our eyes, then straight too far. You know, it seems like most of, you know, what most people try to do, but I, I know I've, I've looked at Astro Bin and a few other places and compared various versions of the same deep sky object. It's a, it's all over the place, you know, as far as what you end up with. Um, and there's nothing wrong with the, you know, being a little artistic with it. I don't think. Yeah. Um, but, but it can get out of bounds. There, uh, if you haven't seen it, there's a, picture you of from one of the recent astronomy pictures of the day um, from maybe only a couple days ago. So this incredible the composite of the Horsehead Nebula. Okay. Are you uh, what's your what's your username on Astro Ben? Oh I, I don't have one. I don't have anything on Astro Gotcha. Ben. But uh you know it's a place you can go and see what people are doing for processing. I, I I've kind of gone there to see well you know, is this this thing I just processed anywhere close to what the usual um, result is, and uh, just try to keep it keep it um, somewhat realistic. But there's a wide range. Yeah, I mean, it's like a, to me, it gives you a good template, like where to start. Because if you see twenty five consistent images, same color you know, within the same color palette, then you're like, hey, okay, that's is likely where I need to be to get my image to. Mm -hmm. But if you see something that's like purple and orange and right. it's like, hmm, that's someone trying to be artsy, way yeah. artsy. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that's that's why they somebody, I don't know who, you know, decided on what the, the Hubble space telescope how it would be for their mm -hmm. for H alpha, O3, uh, right? Sulfur. What was it? What was it called? The show? Is it show? HS, HSO, um, whatever those three. I think it's hydrogen, hydrogen sulfur, sulfur, and sulfur oxygen. hydrogen, oxygen. Right. Yeah. Right. And, and you know, and, some of it, I think some of it's very tasteful. I'm not a huge fan of the greens. Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen some people go way overboard with the green. I'm not saying that green doesn't exist, 
in space. It does. But in nebulas, I, I just don't think that there is green being emitted by nebulas. That's from everything so that I read. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, <laughs> ironically, you know, the, the sensor on, I think all the cameras I have, it's RGGB, so you get twice as much green as blue yeah. and red. And, it, you know, when you pop up the unprocessed, uncolor corrected picture, it's always a green cast. Right, right. <laughs> so you just know that's not right. You know, it looks like right. the Wicked Witch of the East. So. <laughs> hey, Miguel? Grant? Did, did, hey. did I hear you say there's not much green from Nebula, emitted from Nebula? Okay, let me let me rephrase that. The particular, <laughs> the particular, I think we had this conversation a while back. The particular color of green that you see in a lot of the show images isn't, in my, from what I've read, isn't the right representation of the color green that you see. Okay, all right. And, and, I just... and the, the reason for that is when green is present in a nebula, from, from what I remember, it's is it the, the the is it the magnesium? It's the the iron. It's a result of the iron, and that's being dispelled from the star, right? That, that, that's after the star <laughs> goes uh, supernova. <clears throat> it's 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 not that shade of green that you see in a lot of these images. Okay, all right. I just. You you kind of, it sounded like you made a blanket statement. I didn't want that other guy over there, G, to get confused about color. Who's that? I thought that was you. Who's the other G? <laughs> that's that's this guy over here. <laughs> He's, now let me tell you, this guy's easily confused. Gotcha. <laughs> Funny. And again, I, I'm still learning, so I could be I could be way off base with with what I've read and. No, I'm, you're you're right. It's the I'm colors. Okay with being educated by by people who've been doing this for 20, 30 years. Oh, but, it, yeah. For me, I'm just like I said. I, I see some Hubble panels. Like okay, like even the blue. Some of the blues are like, man, that's like a baby blue or a powder blue. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a sky blue. That's it's too yeah. vibrant. Yeah, those. That's what. Uh, yeah, I come in with the same kind of thoughts, and then I find out that it's totally subjective. Because exactly. the colors that you're going to get aren't going to need anywhere near what you see if you get halfway between here and there. it's yeah, it's all subjective. So yeah, definitely. and so yeah, you see, I, I see some of those images and I think you know that guy really likes blue or that guy's a real Chartreuse fan. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so I wouldn't. But uh, like a, a lot of the images lately that I'm seeing on Astrobin and just other sites is they're sh they're shooting for like 40 50 60 70 80 hours the reason That's... they're doing that is to extract more hydrogen alpha so okay. you're seeing images like i'm looking at one right now let me see if i can bring this over here hold on and let's go back to share my screen Let me make this even bigger. So well, there. they're well, saying well. that, yes, this was, <laughs> I think this was like a uh, hundred hours, right? Give me a wide, give me a wide screen on that one. I can't, I, that's, that's too small. Yeah, that's nice. That's wild. But my thing is, is it really this color red? Hydrogen. And oh I, think answer, I think the answer is no. I don't you, think you'd so. have to you'd have to get a uh, full spectrum uh, something that you could control the bandwidth on the on the emitter, and then find out where in the where in the red band that color sh is showing, mm -hmm. and then you could then you can look at that and go, that's legit, as opposed to somebody shifted it down. Right. So for me, in Pix Insight, SPCC. It's a long, it's a long winded name. Spectral. Yeah. To me, that's a good starting point. And if you can keep your final image near that, you're good. 
Now, is this something, what is this that you, is this your image? No, no, no. This is the image of the day okay. on Astro Ben. Do you still see my page? Okay. What is so supposed I'm, to be, what is supposed to be that object in the center? That's uh, M31. Okay. That's just bogus. Somebody just farted around with that. There is no red nebulosity between or on the other side of Andromeda. Well, that's they're that saying, is absolutely pardon. They're saying yes, there is hydrogen. How many, how many astrophotographs? Look at all, okay. So I even have questions about this. Uh you can't see my where my cursor's at. So look look but, look at this. This was 273 hours. Okay. And they used uh, uh, mono. Mono camera. They did blue, green, RGB, RGB filters. Uh, then they did H alpha, a luminance. So I guess between two, two, two observers, they collected this amount of data. They used similar filters, RGB, O3, HA, and the luminance. So here's the original. Uh, that that blue thing up there, that's you know, okay, so here's here's my here's my point of view on that. Okay. Considering that the Andromeda galaxy has been a focus of photography for since since its discovery. Okay. Uh I would be I would be completely surprised if this is the first time anybody imaged that galaxy without seeing a hint just a hint of that blue region and any of that red nebulosity okay i have so never for... seen oh and that is just and quite honestly i and the problem is that's such a small image i'm looking at it's it's tough and i yeah yeah scroll out a little bit more just yeah, see on the right, on the right. You see that right on on the right hand. Yeah, see that extended uh no, uh move more to your left. Yeah, right there. That's where it starts. That area right there. That brownish. No, no, no. Come back, come back, come back. So you're right. Yeah, stop. Stop, stop, move up. Slowly move up. No, the cursor, the cursor. Yeah, right in there. You see that that wing, that that nebulosity wing, that brownish haze. Yeah, never seen that. Never seen a hint of that. No matter, I've seen this galaxy so overexposed that 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 that, that that's never been there. Andromeda has always been a very nice elliptical shaped galaxy, hmm. regardless of the exposure time from. You know, from seconds to to days of exposure time. Uh, so you don't, just, you don't think, pardon? So you don't think uh, again? I'm just trying to process this as well. Two hundred and seventy three hours. How many days is that? I, you know, like so I said, say, like I said, for. So let's say you have eight hour nights. Two seventy three divided by eight. Essentially, if you had. A moonless night for 34 days, and you image this eight hours every night. You're well, thinking okay. that you can't, you cannot. It's it's inconceivable. Well, think it, think of it this way. Think of it this way. What kind of processing would you need to bring out that 30th magnitude haze and not blow out? The majority of that that nebula that nebula is bright when you have five hours of, of light exposure that andromeda galaxy is so bright that that is a target for everybody and and that right there okay that central image where you see the dust lanes yeah okay on what uh maybe a a three hour exposure total is what you get with that and you're saying that you're just getting that with 240 hours? See, what I'm saying here is there is some kind of freaking processing going on here that keeps this stuff out here, which grand total is magnitude 40, 
and this center here, which is magnitude three, yeah. at equal brightness. Right. That is equal brightness. How I are they? Doing, how are they doing that? And then also, let's consider. Let's consider taking and processing an image of that length. You said two hundred forty hours. Two hundred seventy-three. Two hundred seventy-three hours. Okay. What kind of data is 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 being removed? What kind of date? You know, it's just it just that length of time that they're saying that 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 length of time. I just again, you know, you, you, you hear it in my voice, you hear it in my actions. I think that that is there's some there there's absolutely something wrong yeah. with that image. I've never I've never seen a hint of nebulosity around that thing in any any andromeda image that i've ever seen and there are thousands of them so yeah so like yeah sorry those so, guys they're doing that imaging see remember back in the day of film days if you expose too long you get something called reciprocity failure okay uh, I, I, don't, I don't know what kind of artifacts or what kind of overall effects you get on digital images when you take data that large and try to do reduce it down to a single image. You know what kind of artifacts are being in, in, inserted into that. You know what I mean? It's, it's hard for me to kind of put into words, but so there, there, there could be always artifacts, and I, I, you know, I think um, you know, you always have to question it. But I, I just posted a link to the uh, story from February about that blue region to the left of Andromeda because yep. I remember. That came. That story was pretty big news at the time. I don't know if it's still newsy, but they, some amateurs did a, a long O3 uh, filter exposure and saw this these fuzzy, are, weird patch. These are the Andromeda. guys. These are the guys, uh, Dave. Okay. So they're saying that there's a threshold of imaging that you have to pass before you can see that region that's the oxygen oh sure oh sure right so it's being illuminated by that you know that blue star oh uh, again that's what they're saying so this blue star right here is causing that blue fuzzy patch is, is, is ionizing this yeah. region of gas right yeah. here that's always possible but it just on, doesn't on do any on any reasonably long term uh, image, you would expect to see some kind of haze in that. For that, well, thing, here, I, here's another thing, Grant. How many people shoot O3 filters on the Andromeda? It doesn't matter. A lot of people do because, RGB, and that's in the RGB. That's in the green blue. That would okay. come out. It doesn't okay. matter. Filters okay. you use it. Okay. Right. But you know, another weird example. I I can't remember the details of, but um, was. Some amateur astronomer, photographer, astrophotographer set up in the dark sky region of uh, South Af Southeast Africa, Southwest Africa. Zambia. Zambia. Yeah, he just, he just kind of pointed the scope at some region of the sky and exposed for 30 hours, and he, he found a new nebula that no one had ever yeah, seen. Serious. Okay. This guy right here, Brave Oh, really? Is that the guy? Yes. Yep, Brave Falls. Here it is. Uh, is. This this montage that you have here is it the same guys with the Andromeda image? Yes. Okay. Oh, it's the same guy. So, uh, let me find it. Those images just look I... too cooked to me. They're somewhat like cooked. <laughs> <laughs> no. That, are no, these guys are breaking that, or these guys are breaking new ground? Uh, I think it's here. It is the new discovery right here. Here it is. It's called the Kyber Crystal Nebula. There are two of them. This one and the Pistachio Nebula. So these are reflection nebula that just no no one had ever exposed long enough to bring them forward. Is that what you're right. saying? So this one, eighty three hours. And... <laughs> 83 hours. So here's the original from what he's saying. And here's the processed. 
wait a minute. Blink back and forth between original and processed. What do you mean by what do you mean by original? I guess with all the natural stars. Oh. Okay. Because the original looks better than the processed version. <laughs> I I agree. <laughs> it almost looked like there's hazing, like he tried to emphasize or put an emphasis on the ne the, the the dust lanes of the nebula. You're right. I I think that his lens fogged up. <laughs> like I think he tried to subtract out the stars and failed yeah. to really do that very yeah. well. And here's, let me find the other one. So was it that? And where are these guys from? I think he is in Texas, oh. but he has a remote site in Zambia. Yeah. Let me try to find it. New discovery. Oh. Excuse me. Oh, bless you. Coming down with a cold. It's that time of year again. So here's another one. And no, you won't catch COVID through the TV screen. <laughs> well, Light, Lightning Bolt Nebula. That's another one of his from July of this year. How about that? And this one is 81 hours. So it's between him and this other guy. Let me see if I can find that pistachio. Here it is. The pistachio nebula. Really? The one that you showed earlier, that looked more like a pistachio. That's sort of like a blue pistachio, no? Yeah. This, this is the if, he, if he goes back to the other one, you can see where the two shells are splitting off. <laughs> so here's the here's the original from what they're saying. <laughs> and to me, this looks good. This is, you know. Oh, that's yeah. a shell. That's a shell pistachio. Yeah. yeah. Oh, the yeah. other one was where the shells are starting to come off. Okay. All right. <laughs> so this is the the region of space where these nebulas were discovered. So this is the lightning bolt nebula, and this is the pistachio yeah. nebula. I sure wish I was sure wish Mark and Joe had to taken off. <laughs> <laughs> Man, they they they'd be the ones to tell me I'm full of shit, or I might have something going on here. <laughs> well, we can de definitely bring it up the next time. It's a pretty uh, deep. It's a pretty deep rabbit hole. If you go down. Yeah, but but it makes what? me think. To, to tell you, me that I'm full of shit? Hell no! no that's that's a makes, little divot. It makes me think that if you you point a telescope at any place and collect eighty or a hundred hours of data, you might find yeah. something fun. Day? A lot, a lot Day? of blue and a lot of red. <laughs> Maybe like Hubble going back to like 10 billion years before the creation of the... Yeah, that deep field by Hubble. Yeah, <laughs> Point that in a blank spot of sky and then expose that for 100 days. All right. Me, here's yeah. another one I, I find interesting. Let me find it here. And you know what? Not even the Hubble caught any nebulosity in that image. Yeah. And it went back to magnitude 26, I think. Bear with me for a second. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Back that bus up. Back that bus up. Keep going. Keep going. There. How did they get that picture of Io? Now, see, these guys are full of it. These guys are full of it. That's, <laughs> I, that's, they're claiming that's Io, aren't they? That? No. This right here? Or just yeah. Aurora? That's just a landscape. That's probably in uh, no. That's an Iceland. I, I couldn't believe they had a landscape in these astro photos. Yeah, hold on. Where is? That's not it. Oh, that's a that's a spaceship there. Come on. Yeah. Come on. I think there's a lot of artistic license being taken here. Well, in the astronomy picture of the day, definitely. There's all you know a whole whole bunch of different things that show up but um some of them yeah. are composites so here's one that yeah, i think that's why i'm kind of yeah dave you're right that's what i mean there's all kinds of different things so i mean uh ph photographic shenanigans yeah oh hey Lair. oh my god Yikes. Yikes. Hey, oh, so, something's going on with the site i can't search for anything uh, I wonder if that's by design. It's fatal. 
<laughs> no, nope, I've always been able to search. Yeah, something they might be doing maintenance. Uh huh. Or they might be covering up. <laughs> analyzing these images too long. So <laughs> I can find them on Flickr. Hold on. What the hell happened the other day? I thought. Oh, guys! By the way, the keypad on my uh, Ioptron scope was starting to go bad. I got some keypad fix off the uh, off of Amazon. Man, that that? that that brought the keypad back in a heartbeat. That's pretty good stuff. What what is what is what keypad is it? fix? Um, you know, it's like you know the buttons on your hand controller. Yes. When they start, when you start taking a lot of force to get them to work. That coating on the pad on the rubber pads wearing wearing off. Hmm. So this is kind of like a conductive paint, and you pull your keypad. You look at the back, and you got these little black pads yeah. where it makes yeah. contact with the PC board. Yes, Just paint that on there. Give it twenty four hours. Put it back together, and you got a brand new hand controller. Oh, <laughs> they won. They won three hundred bucks for my iOptron EQ thirty keypad or hand controller. Ah, two hundred bucks for that controller. Wow. So here's another, um, I think, Grant, we, we talked about this one. So this is M15. Really? Yeah. What you're seeing around it is IFN, Integrated Flux Nebula. Okay. And and right above it is a reflection nebula. And that's what's giving it this blue. That's M15 in the center? Yes, sir. You would never oh. think any of that stuff is around that because M15 is surrounded by black. <laughs> well, he did a total of three hours. Let me see. Hold on. If I can find him on. What's this guy's name again? This is uh, the Galactic Hunter. What's his name? Antoine. Antoine, okay. What? Russian? Yeah. Ukrainian? Oh, no, no, French. French. French guy. He lives in uh, Vegas. I've seen, but did he did he migrate from these other countries? I France. I've seen these artists from like um, Eastern Europe. Man, they have got some crazy visions. Let me see if I can find it. Hold on. Huh. So M fifteen is a globular cluster on my chart, and yep. looks like they, it is. So here they it is. Blew right. out, they blew out the stars to get the surroundings. Well, See, that's again, I come back to that, Dave. You know, they're doing some compression things. And that's why I wish Mark was here because he could tell us how yeah. these guys are getting magnitude 30 uh, objects and not blow out the magnitude five. Objects. I can explain. How could I? That's what I did for M42. Uh -huh. I did an, H, an HDR composite. Right. So uh -huh. I did. Really short exposures, three <laughs> seconds, five seconds at the most yeah. for the core. And then I progressively started increasing my exposures. Gotcha. Until I stopped at this, 90 seconds. This is this is some hellacious magnitudes of order, um, even for HDR. But yeah, yeah. I, I get your I get what you're saying. But I, yeah, I don't think this is HDR. Uh, let's see oh, if he lists process. It would have to be. I mean, they're they're trying to. So fourteen hours. Magnitude, fourteen hours. Four objects without blowing it out, uh, 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 along with all the ranges from magnitude three to magnitude thirty. Uh, I just yeah, that's. So here, here's what he said. He I decided he he did three hours of data. 30 seconds. So he started with 30 second exposures for yeah. three hours, then came back and did five minute exposures for 14 hours. Right. And, and he made a video about it and all the good stuff, but this well, is the I'm, this is the end product. So here's the here, here's another way of explaining where my where my where my spidey sensors are senses are going off here. Okay. Is if, if you have a bright object and right next to it, you have a dim object, okay? And you expose for the bright object, you don't see the dim object. Correct. But then when you expose to capture the bright, so let's say this is a one second exposure gets this, but none of this, okay? 
Now you want some of this, so now you go up to 30 seconds. You want to blow you out. to see this. This thing goes boom. Right. This starts to wipe out this. Right. That's where so, I'm going. That's where I'm going with that Andromeda and some of these other images like M M15. You know, so, if you're exposing it, this for, for 30 hours and this you can only expose for an hour before it starts seconds. blowing out. Yeah. So in in Pix Insight, there is a process called HDR multiscale. Yeah. Where it takes the bright regions and the dim regions. I get that, but here's the problem: the glare from this object is 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 it's just wiping out the the few photons that you're getting from this object. There's no way to recover this because it's being washed out by this. It's like Mark was saying about uh, light uh, light skies, light blue skies versus dark uh, dark skies. With all that light that's that's in the light blue skies, you can't you know you won't see that dim stuff because this light. Is is wiping this out, and and the same thing happens with these with these bright centrally objects. You're going to get this flaring, and these photons that you're capturing from this big flare is going to be washing out the few photons you're trying to capture on this very dim object. So I should be doing that, and that's and, and I, it, that's about the best way I can articulate it because we've seen it in film. You know, if you try to shoot for a dim object. Everything bright just starts to flood out the image, and you can't yeah. recover this even over, on a over digital exposed. image. Yeah, overexposed. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So I, I think a lot of those pictures you see with a big dynamic range are actual, you know, uh, Photoshop compo layers. They're composites mm -hmm. put together yep. in Photoshop. Because how else do you get the dynamic range to, to look? That's what, and yeah, that it, it, you, they'd have to be doing yeah. something because they can't be. How are they? How are they getting these super long exposures to pull out this nebulosity, and not have the flaring from all of those much brighter objects in that field in that frame? It's it's got to be it's got to be some hell of an image processing because. You know, if you look at if you look at all those bright stars, right? They're gonna flare on that on that digital image. They're gonna flare. Um, those optics, I don't know what kind of optics they're using, but you know, every every piece of glass is going to have a bit of of flaring diffraction. If if Bill Dubert were here, he could tell you exactly what it is. Yeah, it's, um, um ED. Enhanced enhanced dispersion. That's what I mean. They must have some, you know. Again, like I said, I, you know, it's uh, the fact that these guys have been doing this how long? This guy's been doing this how long? Miguel, how Ooh. long has this guy been doing these kind of images? I can, I, I, I don't know. I can check a year, two years. Because if so, there, you know, there, there are people with more smarts on this than me, and if they're not flag in this so Antoine this guy's legit and you're right Dave you're I right, say right. You use for, Photoshop to create layers and then you can you can do that so Antoine's been doing this since 2015 okay seven so years eight, eight years, years. Yeah. and Bray Falls I wish I wish Dan was online he could tell me more about these guys well, Dan crashed. Yeah, no, and well deserved. <laughs> he's, he's done. I, I, but his, 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 his image is still with us. <laughs> Let's see, Bray Falls. There he is. Anyway, I hate to make such a big deal. It's just, it's, it's, it's just, it flies so in the face of. So I've seen. Bra Brave Falls has been doing this since 2017. Okay. The fact that nobody's caught on to it. It's kind of like Villa, uh, Millie Vanilli. Can you remember those guys? <laughs> and they got away with it only for so long. Right. <laughs> and it, with, the, with the amount of expertise that is out there seeing those images, yeah, if there was something to be called out that's just a, that's just incredibly amazing that they can do that he's got that I, I just sort of assume everything on the uh, astronomy picture of the day from NASA is a 
is a composite of some kind. It's yeah, not probably good, yeah. It's almost almost everything because they, they do great art, but and uh, yeah. they want to make a scientific point. Sure. Just, whatever. They, they if there's good. if there's some legitimacy to it, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. But to uh you know create artsy pictures for the sake of creating artsy pictures, that's good too. But if you're trying to get science out of it. I mean, that's, that's, unfortunately, that is what gets you clicks and likes on social media. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's like, it's like Lincoln said, don't believe half the stuff you read on the internet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I gotta, I gotta get going. Oh, man. It was it's fun. Hot. I got to fix up a big old pot of beef stew to last me through the next couple of days. I got a cold and I'm going to be out of it for the next three days. Yep. Got you some rest, Grant. Uh, yeah, hey, Grant, before you, before you go, yeah. did you get that L-Quad filter? Have they sh I haven't got to notice that they're shipping it yet. Okay, okay. Uh, I was watching a review about it the other day compared yeah. to the L-Pro and some other filters. It's It seems to be a really good broadband filter. I'm looking forward to seeing what it does to the light pollution out here. Yep. yep. Yeah. Um, however, if I can't get rid of these stupid floaters in my eye, I'm going to have to break out my camera. <laughs> hmm. well, I, I got floaters. That, um, well, yeah. you know what? You know, it's like, okay, you wear glasses, right, Dave? I you do. know how when, you, when you're, when you're, when you're outside where it's a little chilly and your breath happens to go in front of your glasses and it kind of fog up for a moment and then it goes away. Yeah. I get, I get the same thing. I can I can move my eye and there'll be this this out of focus, kind of like there's a like a sheet of very yeah. very translucent paper going in front of it, you know, and yeah. go over that way. Yeah. But I don't a, have glasses on, so <laughs> well it's a this film that breaks loose from your eye and um you know the, the pattern's a little different in the left eye than the right eye, but both yeah. of my eyes have it. Yeah. And and uh I think it, it it's not good for visual astronomy. I know that. <laughs> well, the eye tends to take care of that. I mean, it it it's 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 recycling the fluid. It's cleaning itself. It's the it's, floaters. Yeah, I've got floaters for a long time. It's not. Yeah, it's not a disease that you know really causes a lot of headache and. Um, no. But it's it's a little bit annoying on occasion. But I, I did go to see an eye doctor a couple of months ago, and he's and I was describing what I've been seeing. I also had something else that was absolutely a neurological thing. And I was kind of worried about it. And as I was describing, right, I'm making, I've, I've been making this big note about how this thing progresses in my field of view, right? And I'm reading it off to this doctor and he's like, okay, okay, okay. And I finish, he goes, yeah, you got, a, you got an optical, uh, you got an op optical migraine. But oh. without missing a beat after the period of my big long description, he goes, yeah. You got an optimal migraine. I love your description. I've never had a patient do it like that before. <laughs> and I said, well, I don't have a headache. He said, well, that's not the headache kind of migraine. So, yeah. <laughs> I've never heard that. Yeah, well, they're called optical my, uh Ocular? Maybe it's, maybe it's called an ocular migraine. Um, pretty, but, pretty common at a certain age. So a lot of people get them. Yeah. And so what it's... What are you going to do? It's kind of annoying, especially when you get this flash off to the side. And you're like, you know, yeah. and, and then you get these little things. It's, you get these little things off of the peripheral vision, and you look down looking for that damn snake or something that's moved over yeah. here. <laughs> yeah, had a little flashes for a while when, when yeah. it was breaking loose. That's one, you know, another reason I want to do imaging and not the eye. Oh yeah, that's that's exactly right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. right. No, in the right place. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. You start out, you start out with eyes and seven and a half millimeter pupils, and and you can see the trapezium, all the components of the trapezium. And then as you get older, you start kind of going to the brighter things and the brighter things, and then you break into the photography. <laughs> right. Next right. thing you know, you're, you're staring at an Android tablet all night. So That's there you right. go. That's right. And thank you, Miguel. You're. You're seeing it too. Dan, years ago, he migrated from sitting outside to staying in his car while he's imaging. Definitely. It makes it a lot easier. No. Yeah, it does. 
Of course, at Promising Park, you can always put up a. You got you know you got access to that twenty amp circuit on the pads, so you can get a, you get yourself a really nice little space heater going. Yep, definitely. All right, twenty well, amps. Yeah, that's been good, and All right. we appreciate you guys uh, coming here today to um, just. Oh yeah. Hear, hear me talk about my experience. I appreciate. They, it. They said there was going to be a good guy talking tonight. Yep, appreciate it. Sure I'm learning. I can I can only get better from here, and that's that's my there goal. You go. All right, Miguel. Take care, and I'll see you, see you sometime, Dave. See you sometime, Grant. So y'all take yep. care. Absolutely. Uh, happy. Uh, uh, I don't talk to you before then. Happy Thanksgiving. Same yeah. to you. Happy Thanksgiving right. to you all. all take right. care. Bye. -bye. Bye.